Great. Thank you very much, Nate. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you guys. And it's, it was great to be with you at the dinner last night. So uh, it's a great program, as you know. And, and I feel the same way. Very glad to be here to speak with you today. <clears throat> now, my own experience as being a dad and being a teacher kind of accidentally coincided in terms of time. That is to say, my wife and I were married in the summer of 2000. And then 11 months later, we had our first child. And just a few weeks after that, I started teaching here at the Heights. So being a new dad and being a rookie teacher were concomitant for me. And <clears throat> it was, you know, over the decades, I've been able to kind of ponder or at least experience what it is to be both a dad and a teacher and see how those two things influence one another. So when I heard about this topic, I kind of jumped on that as something that I'd like to speak about. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Admittedly, right, not everybody here is a dad or is going to be a dad, but we think, too, not just of the biological reality of being a father, but spiritual fatherhood, too. And certainly teaching, you know, lines right up with that, helping raise and mentor and direct boys and young men to manhood and you know, daughters, too. But so there's a spiritual fatherhood, if not even the, the reality of the fatherhood of, of biology. And before I talk about one of the vocations, teacher or father influencing the other, I just make two notes about how they're very similar just all the way across the board. Namely, being a teacher and being a dad are both very human activities, right? This is super obvious in, in being a dad, that your everyday life, your working towards your salvation, the things that you are constantly thinking about and planning for and worrying about are intimately bound up with your wife and your children, right? These people are partly your means of sanctification, and you're thinking about their sanctification, and you're working on that with them together. So it's a very human thing to be a dad, as you know. Teaching is a really human thing, too. There's a great book out there called The Art of Teaching, written by Gilbert Hyatt, and besides being a great book, the title is really interesting to think about as well. You might ponder first just art in general, like I'm studying art in college, right? And so every artist is using some stuff to make something. And the different arts differ from one another insofar as, at least in part, insofar as they have to do with different matter. So the sculptor deals with clay or marble, and the musician deals with uh, rhythms and notes and harmonies. And the poet is a wordsmith. Okay? Now, teaching being an art as well, and then maybe this is slightly analogical, but maybe not. But then what's interesting about teaching is akin maybe to like being a doctor, the stuff that you're working with is, is not static. So if you understand how clay works, you can put it together, and there you go, and you kind of put the clay in this place, and you maybe you put it in the, in, in the fire or whatnot, and then it sets. And marble, I know you have to be careful, but if you know how to work with marble, then you chisel just right, and then it kind of puts its thing in the, in the right place, and then you're done. But when you're teaching, and you guys know this, you've got these human persons in front of you. They think, and they will, and they resist and they move themselves, and they like certain things, and they don't like certain things. And so, um, you know, your matter that you're, being kind of poetical here, crafting, it's a thinking, willing, loving, you know, human person. So they're both, again, very, very human things. Now, being a teacher also means, and I remember my wife had this, this experience because she was a Montessori teacher before, and she said, you know, it's hard as a teacher because your work often comes home with you. And I don't mean that in the sense you might think of it. And this is a rookie teacher mistake to get Trader Joe's bags and take notebooks home. And I'm going to grade these, you know, after the kids go to bed. Or I'm going to work on those. Like, like, leave your work at work. Like, get your work done and then leave it at work and don't bring your work home with you. But if you're selling widgets, you know, the widgets are done and then you go home. But when you're dealing with, with children and young men, right? You, you're thinking about them. Because it's not just a teaching thing, right? It's a, it's a person thing. So you know that that boy, right, that his dad has been deployed overseas. And that's on your mind. And you don't just kind of leave, leave that at work. It's, it's 
dinner table fodder, or you're talking with your wife when you walk with her about the travails or the joys or the difficulties with certain students. So again, it's a very human thing. Also on a side note, as a, as a dad, right, moms and dads name their children, and then you find as a teacher that certain names just won't work for you because how about, you know, Engelbert? You're like, Engelbert's, oh, no, that kid, no, no, <laughs> not naming him that. So at any rate, okay, so how does being a teacher influence you in your fatherhood? First, I think, and we got the whole gamut here, just like at the Heights, we've got guys who are old guys and young guys and married guys and not married guys, and so too with the conference. But hey, you young guys who are getting ready to get married or you might, you know, get married someday. I know it's funny in Pride and Prejudice when Elizabeth Bennett finally starts to think that she likes Darcy and then when did you start? She goes, when I saw his beautiful house, right? But there's something to that, like being ready to be married and to be a dad. Um, I'm getting somewhere with this, I really am. My wife wanted to garden, and there was an interesting book. I didn't know that much about gardening, but this book that I found, it says, well, I'm going to tell you how to set up your garden. You just have to think about what it is to be a plant and what do plants want. I'm like, okay, right? Well, what do plants Well, plants want water, and plants want sunlight, and plants want nutrients from the soil. Oh, wait, they also want to be um, stable in the soil, so the soil has to have a certain set of qualities. It's got to be porous enough that the water can get down in. It's got to have obstacles removed. It's got to be nutrient rich. It's got to be able to be such that the roots can grow down and, and grab hold. So then she goes, the author, so let's make your garden area able to do all those things that plants want to do. That was pretty smart way to introduce that idea. So, I mean, you know, when you think about getting married and you think about what do I want in a wife, and that's true, you should think about that. But also there's you kind of forming yourself and, you know, women understand very intimately that their um, being a wife is super bound up with being a mother, most likely. And so what do they, you know, they look at a guy, is he going to be a good dad to my children, she says. So gosh, being a teacher, you get boatloads of experience in dealing with kids. My first year here, I had like 20 kids, 30 hours a week. That's 600 kid hours a week. If you don't want to do it that way, it's still 100 plus hours in a month of dealing with kids. So you've done that for two years. You have thousands of hours of experience. You know how to deal with children. My wife saw that as our young daughter was just growing up. Gosh, you kind of know what you're doing already. And it's because you know how to teach, and teaching is dealing with kids. So that's super helpful. Um, remember those two offices that, of dads, too. Really fundamental. Dads protect. Dads provide. And teachers do that, too. Now, as male teachers, in, in a pretty interesting way. So protecting, I mean, just take, you know, we took 50 fifth grade boys on a hike. Every year we go to a place, and then there are 15, 20-foot crevices they could fall into. Like, you're protecting, right? You're thinking about what are the dangers and how can we not you know, fall into them, literally. But guys, again, interestingly, it's not, you don't protect with bubble wrap. You don't say, let's not do that because you might. Guys go, hey, that's a pretty cool thing. Let's do it in this way so that we'll be okay. But we kind of go towards elements that have a little bit of risk and challenge to them. And that's good for young people as they're growing. So dads protect and teachers protect. Dads provide. Teachers kind of provide, too. It's a little bit different, right? I think SAT analogy style, that moms are to food as dad is to money, which is to say, and maybe my experience is different. Maybe I'm, you know, thinking that uh, this, this set of one is the way that everybody is. But I think that um, just as moms would take it hard if their child doesn't gain weight, because they think my job is to feed I know that I take money problems hard, right? Because I think I've got to, you know, the underlying is I've got to be able to do these things that everybody needs in order to the shoes and the clothes and the tuition and, right? So dads provide, for sure. You're not providing in the same way as a teacher, granted, but you're providing and giving opportunities for growth, chances to learn, experiences to share. Again, field trips are a great example of that. 
Now, being a teacher that's not just, you know, giving you experience in dealing with kids, but you get a lot of experience dealing with parents and families. It's a really great thing. Again, your first year teaching and then parent-teacher conferences come up. You've been at it for a couple of months, and the parents are coming to you to talk to you about their kid, and they don't just talk about the student. They talk about their whole family. They talk about, and one hopes charitably and with each other, but each other. When you're learning how moms and dads and wives and husbands and siblings and college-age siblings and everything, like you've got your experience of that growing up in a family, and you're, you're dealing with tons of families, and you're getting a lot of you know, incidents from which you can draw universals. It's very helpful in that way. And you'll find it's reciprocal, which is interesting. Parents will come and say, hey, we're having a hard time with one of our kids in this. What, what do you think? Then sometimes my answer is, man, that sounds like my second child, and I don't know what to do, so can we figure this out together? Like, I don't know what works or what doesn't work. <coughs> Teaching also gives you tons of confidence. I think just by its very nature, it has to if it goes well. Because think about it, like again, you're a rookie teacher, you walk in the first day, you're automatically an authority. You might not even feel that way, but you are. I mean, all the kids look at you and you're the guy in charge and you know. And parents ask you, right, how's he doing? And, and what do you guys, and what's your plan for this and that? And you learn that you can do these things and people look to you like you can do these things and so you do. So confidence is a great thing to have as a dad, as you know, because you have to lead. And it's difficult. But having confidence is very helpful, so teaching influences being a father in that way, too. <clears throat> now, being a dad also has a good amount of influence on being a teacher. The first thing I thought of has to do with setting a tone, an environment, building a culture, just like a home. Okay? And granted, mom and dad are, are both there, right? But... Um, as I teach homeroom, most of my time is with the fifth grade boys. And I think of it in terms of reading. We do a lot of reading together in the lower school here at the Heights. There's obviously a time and a place for diagnostics with respect to reading. You do want to be able to tell families how well their son reads and if he has anything to work on or if you're noticing any issues with his reading or his comprehension. But for us, that's not done during literature class. Literature is, is a shared thing together. So I'm not having the kids read, right? Like, I'm reading. It's like, and this idea didn't come from me, but it's like dad reading to his kids at home. Uh, and, you know, even when I was a young guy, I'm not a young guy anymore, but when I was a young guy, before I was married, I thought, you know, when I'm married, I'm gonna, what am I going to do with my family, right? And high up on the list was, I'm going to read Tolkien. I'm going to read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. I'm going to have a family where we do those things, right? And then sure enough, I do now. I mean, every Sunday, it's Tolkien time. We've got the chair, we've got the light, we've got a glass of bourbon. I don't get to bring the bourbon into the classroom, that doesn't work, but, you know, it's at least a glass of, of tea. But when I read to the kids in the classroom, it's kind of the same thing. And it's funny, like kids at the end of the year, they write, and you know, the parents go, you got to write them a letter to say thank you for things. So I hear often, thank you for the game that you played with us. So they like playing games, like, okay, right? I taught you, but we played games, good. I hear also about the time that we spent reading together. Parents say, he tells me about what it's like. You sit in the chair and you have the lamp turned on. And I mean, what are you saying? You're saying with these other things environmentally or in the culture, you're saying this is a good, beautiful thing that we're going to share together. You don't really say that with words because words don't really matter in that respect. But that's what it says when you say, like, let's do this in the right way. Let's have, let's have a, a, a place to sit. That's all, right? So it's a beautiful thing. So setting a tone in a culture, in a room. Dads do that. Teachers can do that too. I think also, and I've learned this more and more as I teach longer, about trying to teach from a viewpoint of love. And obviously dads want to do that too. So remember... There is a place for the drill instructor. That's the army, okay? But you don't want to parent that way. You don't want to say, Dad, your authority and your mode of moving your children to be your voice getting loud and them 
right? Being worried because you're, and to be sure, like I, as teachers go, I'm known as a guy who runs a tight ship. Like my kids are not jumping all over the place, right? So we, we still have a sense of discipline. Sure, like you have to. I mean, discipline, discipulus, those are related. But remember, just like as a dad, you, you want your kids to know that you love them because love draws and fear pushes, right? So you want, you want to draw them. So also in the classroom, like a dad. I just, right before I came up here, I checked to make sure I had it right because I was worried. And then there was an article on CC Watershed that said, yeah, that was the way that it was. And St. Thomas talking about fear of the Lord, right? And fear, St. Thomas, according to this article, fear comes in two types. There's the fear of the servant and there's filial fear. The fear of the servant is I'm going to get punished for what I've done, okay? So people misunderstand, and maybe you guys don't, but the broader culture doesn't, the, the title, Fear of the Lord as a Gift of the Holy Spirit, they think, sounds like we're afraid that God is going to, to be, um, you know, acting against us and hurting us. That's not fear of the Lord. That's a servile fear. Rather, fear of the Lord is the fear that the child may have, and fear is a funny word there, but they don't want to displease their dad. I went to school with a guy, and he had, a, you know, at this time, like four kids, and one of the kids had cerebral palsy. He could walk and get around, but with, like, braces, and it was difficult. He had, the boy had something of a difficult life, but he's grown and grown and done more and more. But it was funny because all this physical suffering that that boy had gone through... He uh, was not motivated by any threats of pain so that if the, if the dad would go, hey, you're going to get a swat if you do that, the boy didn't care. But he really didn't want to disappoint his dad. And if he found out he had done something that his dad found disappointing, that was what got him. So also as a teacher, we want to love our students and have them know that we like them and want to be around with them. And if they have that good relationship with us, then instead of, you know, again, the servile fear, or instead of being you know, pushed by fear of punishment and things like that, they're going to be more open to learning in part. Learning is a vulnerable thing. So dads, hopefully work from a viewpoint of love. And teachers, too, can do very well when they do so. Even when your students fail. So I've taught grammar for, again, two decades here at the Heights. When I started, I had a, a colleague named Andy Dynan. He teaches now at Ave Maria for a long time, maybe two decades down there. And he said, gosh, when I'm trying to teach classics, I have to start doing English grammar again because students don't know their basics of grammar when they're you know, starting to learn Greek. So I got to backtrack. And I thought, well, that's kind of something that's in my wheelhouse in the fifth grade. So I, you know, just make sure to get down the things that you need to know of how language works so that in the seventh grade at the heights, when you start learning Latin in earnest, it's not foreign to you. Okay. So I'll work with a lot of, you know, definitions of parts of speech. Prepositions, I don't like to define, though. I think a definition for preposition would be too difficult for a fifth grade boy. So I've just got a couple of different lists. Some of you guys in the audience memorized those back in the day. Okay. So A through B prepositions, D through N prepositions, O through W prepositions. And you write them down, and the kids write them down, and then the next day they're going to you know, write them down for you out of memorization. And most kids can you know, get an A on a thing like that. They know most all of them. And maybe there are spelling issues, but you know, they're still... But I had a kid this year, and in the past I would have kind of held him more to the fire. Now his parents had told me ahead of time, and this is always helpful, that they said, our son is bright, but he's lazy. So sometimes he won't work. And then I always ask for clarity. Do you mean he can give me an A on like anything? And if he gives me a C, it's because he didn't apply himself. And they say yes. And I say, I can hold his feet to the fire. And they say yes. Good, right? Because you want to know that. You don't want to hold a kid's feet to the fire when it turns out that, you know, this other guy has got a learning issue and it's hard for him and he's trying, right? Or a guy who came from a school that just wasn't, on the same level, and so for a while, he's got a more difficult time in ramping himself up. But this guy, sure enough, he turns in one of his preposition tests, and it's not very good. And in the past, I would have gone, this is not good, right? You're better than that. 
Now, again, to be sure, you want to you you hold the line. You know, when it just be man, be pam, you go, whatever. But I thought not to push, but to pull. Hey, we have another one tomorrow, and I think you could ace it. I mean ace it. Have everything right. Know it in the right order, even though I won't take off for the order. Spell everything right. Do you think you can do that? I think so, sir. I think you can do it. Let's see you do it. Do it tomorrow. Comes in tomorrow, next day, ace. He's done, right? So even when kids fail, if you can move them by means of the good and love, knowing that you see what's good in them and you see the good that they can do, that's so much better than if you're just hitting them because they failed. Third thing, third way in which dads influence being a teacher. Dads, ha, I have that as B, so maybe that's the second. Dads play the long game, okay? And teachers need to, too. I think about goals as a teacher, and remember, you're more likely to achieve whatever if you know what you're aiming at. So you think about goals. Short-term goals for me as a teacher is like during the year. Okay, I know I want to get mostly done with the math book. You don't have to finish the whole math book. I'm going to read, you know, these three novels. I got to be brute about that because if I just read at the pace that I enjoy, it's going to be too slow. But we've got three novels that we're going to read. So I'm like, well, I've got three months for this guy and three months for that guy. And I kind of divide out the pages. So I know got to read so much every week. But then middle term and long term goals. I mean, the long term goal is heaven. Like, you want your students in heaven. You want your children in heaven. You want to be in heaven. Okay? But those medium-term goals that not everyone thinks about, and maybe you guys do way better than others, but these students that you're teaching, just like these children that you may have as a dad, they're going to be adults someday. These 11-year-old boys who are in front of me all year long, they're going to be grown men someday with their own jobs and their own bosses or superiors and their own callings to marriage, to consecrated life, to being a religious. I mean, if the numbers work out, a lot of them are going to be married and be dads. So I think about that, right? Just like dads do. Moms, I think, have an even better sense of that. I think this is the origin of the phrase, no child of mine, right? moms think, you know, no child of mine is going to act like that. You know, you can't put your elbows on the table. and You got it right. Like, why can't you do that, mom? And she's like, you're going to, someday you're going to be, you know, looking to get married. I mean, you're not going to act like a slob, you know. You need to know how to interact with people in the world. Good. So as a teacher, if you know this, these guys are going to be grown men someday. Because we're not just thinking, can I get him out of the fifth grade? Can I get him to the eighth grade? Can I get him to graduate? Like graduation, Alvaro says this at our graduations, it's, this is not the end. We're not done with you now. We're not all done. Whatever we wanted to do, you're not it yet. You still got more to do. So, like with temperance, okay? I think about temperance, chastity. Like, these are very important for men in the world today. And these young men who are in front of me, 11 years old, like, they're going to need that virtue too. Now, I don't broach, breach? Actually, I don't broach that topic, That's not a topic that I'm bringing up directly in the fifth grade. Except insofar as there are ancillary ways to do it. In other words, right, the fact that these young men need to have custody of their eyes and control of their appetites, I have a little part to play in that because I eat lunch with them. And so I encourage them to not eat their dessert until they've eaten the rest of their food. I correct the boy who one year opened up his bag and said, blueberry yogurt, I don't like blueberry yogurt, threw it away. It's like, hey, it's probably there are a number of better things we could have done than throw away the yogurt because you don't like the flavor, right? Or you encourage kids, kids nowadays, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, we didn't have crustless bread, but some moms are buying the bread that has all the crust cut off so Johnny doesn't have to eat the crust because he doesn't like it. Okay, well... Can we, can we control our appetites in these ways? And again, you're not talking in terms of controlling appetite. You're thinking, 
if we can get food right, we're better off in other areas of temperance later on. So dads play the long game. Teachers play the long game. Remember, too, that young people are more receptive to certain truths than older ones. People ask me often, hey, you're teaching in the fifth grade, you teach seniors. Like, what, how do they compare? Say, in the fifth grade, you're planting seeds, and then for seniors, you're pulling weeds. It's kind of like that. Interestingly, in the history of Western thought, one of the authors that we read is St. Thomas, and we do go over some of his proofs for God's existence. And in the fifth way, as you know, St. Thomas says nature acts for an end, so that natural things in the world that don't have their own intelligence still act always or for the most part towards the attaining of some good. And modern seniors, even Heights educated, have a hard time seeing that. But third, fourth, fifth graders at the Heights don't. The, the fourth graders at the Heights who are going out for their nature classes and journaling and observing the trees and seeing how fruits aid in the dispersal of the seed and how the leaves work and why the leaves do what they do and why this tree lets its leaves out three weeks earlier than those ones, they can see kind of clearly from their experience that, um, your na- that, that it's doing this for this reason. Nature's acting for an end. So I think about that perhaps. I mean, if, if, if you're teaching well, then you think, you know, it's good for them to know these things. And so as we teach it now, they'll need it later on. Guys, as teachers, just like dads, it's very obvious with dads. So I'm saying these obvious things about dads, and you go, yeah, we all knew that, right? Dads have a very large amount of influence on the young people in their care, on their children. I mean, those are the two, right? Mom and dad. Colin Gleason taught me that the number one factor for a boy and young man's confidence is his relationship with his dad. So you know that. Dads have a great influence on their children. Teachers too, right? So as I'm teaching, again, this this senior class, and we read Plato and Aristotle, St. Thomas, St. Augustine. We're reading, you know, the ethics of Aristotle and St. Augustine, which is a great treatise of the confessions on the will and grace and freedom and prayer and love and sin. I was at a senior's graduation party one year, and he commented that he found it really, I don't know what the adjective is going to be. It made a great impression upon him that when I was teaching the year, I told the boys, hey, like we're talking about virtue and doing the right thing and excellence in human actions and how to order yourselves towards the divine properly. And if I'm just doing that in a teaching sort of way, like I'm going to give you some information, but I don't live that way, that's not very good. And I know too, and you guys know this, that kids smell that all that they smell insincerity very, very well. So if you right, I mean, if you... You teach it, you got to do it, right? So I, and I would always tell them too, like St. Augustine is saying, first he says, I'm a sinner. Look at how I was a sinner, he says. And then the reader is kind of supposed to go, yeah, I've, I've been that way. Yeah, this kind of like me too. And to make sure the boys know when we're doing it together, it's not me going, you guys are sinners, right? But it's like you and I have this experience of doing, we're like that, you and I. So it made an impression upon him that I thought, You know, I need to, and every teacher needs to do this, whether you're teaching ethics and religion or not, right? The life that you lead here and elsewhere is, that's impressive upon the young men or the students that you have. As a teacher, just like a dad, again, having this great influence, you have a big influence on the families of the students that you teach. And I think that might have been something that was unexpected for me. But then it just comes out that this is happening. Dad asks, Mr. Seenson, did you say that my son has to tie a double Windsor knot for his tie? Because he says that's the only one. I'm like, no, I didn't say that. But sometimes I come to school and I don't have my tie tied yet, and that's the only knot that I tie. I like the way that the, you know. And the boy comes home and is like, you have to tie your tie like this. Okay. 
Mr. Steenson, did you say, and then Pete Vitz is probably going to laugh because it's happened all the time. Did you say that we have to get 100% beeswax candles for our advent wreath? Well, I told them that that's what I have here in the classroom, and I showed them. What, but then they go home and go, Mr. Steenson said we have to do this, right? And so the families end up being influenced by you and the things that you say and the things that you do. And, of course, your influence upon your students especially, the families too, but the students especially, doesn't end with this end of the school year. Both because they're still in the school environment. You know, the fifth graders are in the sixth or seventh grade now, and they come back to say hi, and I talk to them, and I still know them, and right, we interact. Sometimes you end up being asked to be a confirmation sponsor. But they leave the school at some point. I mean, they become adults, and you've been looking for that, right? They get married. I've gone to at least, we'll have another wedding this summer of a student whom I had taught. They have families. And you say, hey, you had bad handwriting, and I see your daughter holding the pencil the wrong way too, right? Like, <laughs> guys, even, even in the, in, and you realize this the longer that you teach, and I, I know we've got a lot of veteran guys here already, even in the sad parts of life that are part of life, like I've had students, not during the school year itself, but I've had students pass away. And let me tell you, you go to like the funeral, you go through the receiving line, you go to talk to their parents, you have good things to say about their son. Now your role in helping them grieve is so very small, right? And finally it's God, and you may be an instrument for that. But to not just have a nicety, I'm so sorry for your loss, you get to say, I want to tell you very quickly about something your son had done. And you give them this, right? You have a big influence on their lives, on their families. Now remember that being a dad begins with a begetting, right? There's another person in the world, partly from you, like you, following you, being like you, doing like you. And we might even think in a way, and of course with, with small letters, because in the big way, right, we're made in God's image and likeness, but you kind of think like, and you're kind of proud when your child, in the good ways, is like you. Hey, that's like me. That's being a dad in a way. It's kind of being a teacher too. Kind of not. Like, we want to avoid hubris in this matter. We first always understand that the parents are the educators of the children, finally. The primary educators. And the parents say, we want to partner with you to help us in that way, right? So we understand, you understand, I understand. We don't take the place of the parent, to be sure, right? But even insofar as I'm a teacher, am I trying to beget other people like me? Well, in a way, not. I mean, slightly, but kind of not. Because what are we doing here? Well, we're learning about, we're knowing things. I'm a knower and I want these guys to be knowers too, but I'm careful about that, right? I mean, for sure, there are times that there's just, there's one answer, like this is the answer in math, <clears throat> or this is the truth of the faith, or the human soul is rational and immortal, right? Like these things, these aren't really up for debate. Like I know those are true. Okay, good. But when I'm teaching students, I, you know, and then granted, like there's a right answer here and there's a, there's a definite answer here and there's a definite answer here. But I'm, you know, other times I'm still being aware. I don't want them to just parrot me. Okay. We want to avoid being the sage on the stage who just says great things and writes it on the board and then the kids write it down and then you ask them later on a test what you wrote on the board and they write down what you wrote on the board and you tell them that they're smart because they said the same thing that you said, Right. I tell them it's the history of Western thought, this class that I'm teaching. It's not the history of Steenson's thought. So, you know, when you're reading, there's an ambiguous, you know, ambiguity in Plato, and then you could read it this way, you could read it that way. Or I could say, I think this argument doesn't work, and they could say, I think that argument does work. And there's, there's some matters, you know, open for different opinions in that regard. So we're not really thinking, I just want them to be in my image, right? But you're a knower, and through your work as an instrument, God with his work, they come to know too. But interestingly, and again, this is very akin to being a dad, and we'll see this with the best character from the Iliad in just a second. Like, they surpass you. 
I've taught calligraphy in the fifth grade just kind of for kicks now and then for a decade plus. And then, um, you know, every now and then a kid kind of keeps up with it. So this guy kept up with it. And he got married. And he wrote out his own wedding invitations, the envelopes, by hand in straight up calligraphy. Not just nice handwriting with a nice pen, but like a calligraphy pen that ended up, you know, having this slant and everything like that. I said, can you, I mean, the wedding's gone now, but do, can you show me one? And he found a picture. He sent it to me. It was better than mine. And I'm not all that good. But you see your student, not just having learned from you, but surpassing you, right? And who's the best guy in the Iliad? I mean, Hector, in a way. Because first, like a schmo, you read it, you're like, oh, Odysseus, he's really wily, okay? Is that a virtue? Not really. Right? And you see that in the Odyssey. Like, he's got, he's got a lot of things he's got to work through, and he's still... He's a messy character, I think. I'll say that to you guys. I won't. Um, you know, Achilles, he's the best warrior, right? And then you read Plato and you're like, well, there's a reason why Achilles is not in the city. There's no place for Achilles in Socrates' city in the Republic. And they go back and they talk about seeing the underworld later. And there's no Achilles there. Socrates is like, there's kind of a problem with Achilles, right? And there is. And you see that with Achilles' shield because he's got, like, who are you fighting for? Like, I fight for, and you got on the shield. I fight for, you know, harvest and maypoles and weddings and and people growing up and having families and grapes and wine and wheat and bread. And I said, you also destroy that. You're like the destroyer of cities. You fighting for a city, you fighting against a city, right? Achilles is kind of messy. But Hector, and it's super interesting when you realize this, because like it's, it's the Greeks versus the Trojans. And they know each other well enough they can talk the same language. So they're not that far, you know, they're not that dissimilar. But he's, I mean, he's the bad guy. Right? I mean, he's not, I mean, Paris is a bad guy. But there's book six. Hector ends up with his wife and he's a loving husband and his child. And what does he do? He prays that when people see his son having grown up, they say, his dad was Hector. And this boy, this man is a better man than his dad ever was. Right? He wants his son to be known as superior to him. And I think in humility... We might have that goal for our children, too. There's this materialistic way about it. We go, I hope that, you know, they don't have to want like we wanted growing up. I'm going to give right. It's not just like they're be better off than we are. But, and you guys remember this, trying to beat your dad in a game growing up, one-on-one -on -one or something, like, not a big game in the Steenson household. But if they ever did, like, beat you, like, hey, your son is better than you at this thing or that, You've not just begotten them, you've helped them to grow. And seeing yourself surpassed, that really should be not just okay, but kind of what we're doing, right? So with, with being a dad and with being a teacher. I'll close then with just a reminder of St. John the Baptist's words, because on the spiritual plane, I must decrease so that he may increase. Being a dad can be like that in humility, and being a teacher can too. So thank you. Thank you.